can see the resemblance. I can see the resemblance of the bias in you now. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, we, yeah, I sure can. We got some right. features, I tell you. Okay, well, we'll we'll wait just a couple more minutes, and uh, we'll wait the Reverend Gable get in, and then we will introduce ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, and then we will tell you exactly what we will be doing here this evening. Uh, I will let Shawnetta kind of go over that, what we'll be doing this evening. Uh, Shawnetta, you got your uh, paper in front of you? She's muted. You muted. You muted. Uh, you muted, Shawnetta. She's talking. You muted. Yeah, look. I hear you. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. we got you. Okay. okay. I'm trying to <laughs> I'm trying to push buttons. But <laughs> yes. Um, no, I don't have my paper here with me, but um I can we would you tell what we're doing here? I can uh, talk yeah, on I, it. Okay, okay. well. Okay. Uh, we'll just wait okay. a couple more minutes to uh, Reverend Gabriel get in. Uh, okay. Good to see you, Craig. Ain't seen you in a while, man. <laughs> Only thing I see is your pictures on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> you mute it if you're trying to talk. Oh, no. Oh, there we go. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. How Hello. are you? All right. Good to see you. Good to see you. Good to see you too. Haven't seen you in a while. I know you snuck out of town on us. <laughs> All righty. Okay. Very good. How's Mrs. Sloan tonight? She's doing well. Good, good. I think she's on the Zoom on the other end. Okay. In the room. So. Uh, Miss Ella, now I, I'm gonna tell you, mm -hmm. you don't look a day over forty. <laughs> Sir, are you a minister? <laughs> <laughs> Be careful! <laughs> Lightning might hit you. <laughs> I mean, really, for you to uh, have teached in the in the sixties, it don't you don't look that old. You really don't. I, I have to give you those props. Okay, Thank Reverend you. Gabriel's Reverend Gabriel's here tonight, Hello, and, uh, and we will Reverend, go ahead. Uh, was you going to say something? I was just speaking to uh, Reverend Gabriel. <laughs> How are you, Jonathan Byers? Yeah, good to see you. Good to see you. <clears throat> he said he remember you and you was just a baby, uh, Reverend Gabriel. <laughs> yeah, he's known me all my life, but so I didn't I didn't know if it was the same. Uh, Jonathan Byers or not? Yeah. Oh, okay. in there. <laughs> now, his, his grandfather, the great grand, is it grandfather or great grandfather? Witty. Uh, both. The senior yeah. was my great grandfather. Yeah, I, I knew his great grandfather when I was a young man. Now, Jerusalem, the church that you're minister of, is that the same one, Jonathan, that Mar Mar Marge and I went to? Yes. Okay. Uh, let's see, Reverend Moore. Moore. Did Reverend Moore. Moore? Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah, that wow. was him. And, and Brother uh, Gabe, I mean, Brother Sloan, you knew my wife as Margie Carruthers, probably. Yes, Miss Byers, she was my teacher. No, she was Miss Byers. She was Margie Byers. So we had already married. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Because I graduated in 1978. Oh, yeah, she was still there. Yeah, she was, at, I think she was at senior high then. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Actually, she was at there at senior high the whole time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. In Mordor. Okay. In Mordor, yeah. Yeah. Okay, you all, we're going to go ahead and get started. And I'm going to give you a little bit of history about what we are doing. You see over my head what it says. Mm -hmm. Black mm -hmm. Mordor. The untold story. We just come up with this this 
uh, uh, tonight, this evening. <laughs> okay, um, what it is next year, Morse will be celebrating 150 years. And uh, I am one, of, one that is on the committee uh, there, here in Mooresville. And uh, they were trying to put programs together. And I said, well, what about Black, our Black history? They said, we have no Black history here in Mooresville, not whatsoever. Only one that they could think of was uh, 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 the one that put the dime, uh, Samuel Burke, that, yes, uh, Burke. that, yeah. that, that uh, did the dime. Yeah, they did the dime and did the sculpture. And uh, I said, well, there's more history here in Mooresville other than Samuel Burke and Rufus Reed. I don't know, uh, some of you older ones may know or heard of Rufus Reed. Yeah. Uh, Rufus Reed, he was one that he was a, a sharecropper and he was black and he had slaves uh, in Mount Moon. And I said that there's more history here than just those two. So I said, what about our black history? They said, well, we'll just start from 2022 with y'all's history. 2022? I says, no, 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 we, we got history. And so uh, I uh, started questioning them about, you know, getting a documentary, doing a documentary. So they reached out and uh, they had the funds and so they funded us to help do this documentary uh, but it's something that i am very passionate about we have talked to several several uh people some of the elderly ones here and we're gathering so much information and we want to thank you all for being here this this evening to help us with this documentary and by miss ella being uh, uh one of the teachers back here and here here in Mooresville in 1967 and 68 and 60, uh, I, I, I just blew my mind away when Craig told me he knew someone that had taught school here uh, back then and I said Craig we got to get her we got to interview her we got to talk to her <laughs> so Craig made it possible we want to thank you for that Craig mm -hmm. and we also want to interview Craig tonight as well uh, uh, because Craig uh, was one that uh, went on from here, uh, from Warsville High School, and he went into the Air Force, was it, Greg? That's correct. The Air Force. And uh, he <clears throat> did a number of years, and uh, he has a lot to probably tell us uh, about his coming up in the school system. And uh, also, Mr. Byers, uh, you are knowledgeable of our school system somewhat as well by your wife being in it for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So tonight, uh, oh wow, Reverend Dave, <laughs> okay, Claudia, I mean, that's <laughs> uh, So tonight, uh, Reverend Gabriel will give you a kind of layout of some of the things that uh, we will be asking. And, but before we do that, let us bow ahead in a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to speak to your people and you said in all your ways that if we acknowledge you you would direct our path we thank you for the wisdom and knowledge we thank you oh god for letting this moment happen uh, for us together black history here in Mooresville or anyone that was connected to Mooresville that know anything about Mooresville we have an open ear and Father, we thank you now in advance for the conversations, the laughter, the fun. And we want them just to be themselves and just talk, just tell. We want laughter and everything to be involved. We want to know the good, bad, and ugly. And we thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay. Now, like I said, I'm going to let Reverend Gable, he can introduce himself, Sean Edder. Uh, she can, she's a, one of the voiceovers as well, and you, uh, Sean Eccles, and, and then uh, Greg and uh, Miss Ella and uh, Mr. Byers, uh, and uh, y'all can introduce yourselves, uh, but uh, Reverend Gable will be the voiceover for tonight. Okay, so Reverend Gable, however you want to handle it, whatever you want, however you want to start off. 
let me let me clarify with Sean. Is it okay to interview all of them at the same time, or should we be doing it one one at a time? Uh, probably one at a time, uh, unless in one has something they would like to add to what the other one is uh, talking about. We're and recording we asked, right now. Okay, we ask uh, uh, everybody to uh, please, if you're not speaking, to mute yourself and so that the one that uh, is speaking uh, won't have any background uh, to it. Okay, so Reverend Gabriel, I'll let you take over from here. All right. Yes, I am uh, Reverend Gavin Gabriel. Um, it sounds like you guys already talked about a, a little bit of my, my family history. I am the grandson of and great gun, grandson of Weddy Gabriel Jr. and great Weddy Graham Gabriel Sr. Um, as a byproduct, I uh, was born on the or was raised on the land that uh, my family was enslaved upon. And so uh, recovering Black history um, is extremely important to me. Um, I have had the privilege of interviewing so many of your peers, and each of your names have come up several times, so I'm excited to interview you. Um, I will start uh, just in the order of my screen with Mr. Byers, um, and we'll start with uh, your biographical information, so you'll just say your name, uh, the year in which you were born, and where you grew up, um, and then uh, just introduce yourself in general and what you would like to tell us. Uh, up front, and then from there, I'll I'll ask questions. Whenever you're ready. Yes, as I uh, said, I am. Uh, I'll introduce myself as the husband of uh, Margie Ruth Carruthers Byers, and uh, I was born in 1944. October the 5th, I was born in Statesville. I grew up in Troutman. And uh, the road that I grew up on uh, below Troutman is called Byers Road. So some people get us confused about the uh, uh, down off the, um, I think it's 150, that new development down there where you have the, uh, uh, big grocery store and you have all those developments, it says Byers Creek. That's not us. <laughs> That's not us, we, we are not that. Um, I started out, uh, of course I went to school at Unity High School, graduating in 1963. Uh, went to college at A&T, anybody who, who's a Aggie, Aggie pride. And um, I went in as an English teacher. And of course, I also uh, taught history. Later on, I became a counselor, assistant principal, principal, and central office person. I met the love of my life um, in 1968. And I believe this is the same year that I met uh, Ella. Uh, at the time, she was Ella April, and she and my wife were like two peas in a pod. Uh, and when I met these girls, these well, they were girls then. Uh, I think we just hit it on my uh, uh, one of my good friends from A and T, uh, uh, Clifton Turner. Uh, he and Ella were um, involved in our wedding. We got married December 20th of 1969. Reverend, were you born then? <laughs> Not quite, okay. <laughs> but, but anyway, um, Margie grew up in um, Charlotte and she graduated from York Road High School. And I saw her and I saw Ella as just genuine young ladies. And uh, they were always friendly. They were always, and they were sincere. They were not somebody to be played with. Right, Ella? They, we, had to, we had to act ourselves 
in the proper way when we were around them. And, and when I met uh, the two of them, I think I was 23 or 24. And sometimes we guys uh, would get a little rowdy. And, uh, but we always tried to respect her in every way. Um, I taught at Unity High School and at uh, North Iredale High School. I became a counselor at North Iredale High School. I was an assistant principal at South Iredale High School and a principal of two other schools. And I retired from education, officially retired in 1998. And uh, after that, I did some other things for about 10 more years. Always enjoyed being around kids. And I was always highly motivated by seeing our black young people involved in education. Um, one of the young men at uh, Mooresville who came around, I think maybe around 1980, was Mr. C.C. Bankhead. I don't know if Sonetta, Sonetta remembers him or not, but he was a good friend of ours and he uh, uh, was a lovely person also. Margie at Mooresville High School and Ella were, and I'm thinking they people were very sincere when they would talk to me about the two of them. They would say, you know, these, these young ladies are great and they're precious and all these kind of things. And I tried to figure were they talking to me uh, to play a game or were they really sincere? Uh, there was one lady who would always lead out and make sure everything went positive. And her last name was Lawrence. I don't know if Ella remembers her or not, but she was a home economics teacher. Miss Lawrence. And uh, while Margie was there, I wish Ella could have stayed a few years, but I believe she stayed two years and then she moved back to uh, Sumter. But in 1974, uh, it caused a lot of tears and joy. Margie was the person who was the uh, in, a, in the yearbook of 1974, uh, she was the one that it was dedicated to, the Mooresville Senior High School Pitchfork in 1974. And that was a shock to both of us because we didn't realize that they really, really cared that much about us. But, but, but Margie, in summarizing how she felt about Morrisville, she said, you know, at first, I thought it would be like all Caucasian people, but that place grew on, on her and she on them. And they would invite her to things. And uh, we really had a good time. And she also started working. She was a biology teacher. And while she was in Mooresville, she was also involved in the, um, I believe it was the student council. And so they were involved uh, even when there was uh, football games and so forth. But uh, that's a little bit about both of us. And uh, we, I was a member of St. James Baptist Church and which changed to St. James First Baptist. Uh, and it's in Mooresville now. At the, at the time, where we are located was Troutman, but they changed it to Mooresville. So Margie came in, and she was Margie. And she went to Statesville High School in 19, January of 1990. And she did some good things up there. She was in student council and testing coordinator and and she uh, got the job as a counselor there at the, at the school. Um, I, um, I think my wife 
And if you were around Ella, you know, those two ladies could make anybody just feel good about themselves. And Margie was my life. And I've had to learn how to live without her. And uh, I've done pretty well. I've had some hiccups, but with the Lord's help, I've been able to uh, move along without really just giving up. But after 50, almost 51 years, that's a long time. And uh, so when she passed away on uh, in May of 2020, uh, it was like part of me left the earth as well as her. So I appreciate this opportunity. If anybody has anything to ask me, I'm, I'm willing to, to say. Thank you so much for um, sharing all that. And I hope that um, it gives you some joy to remember um, all the things that she she told very, you over the much. years. Um, I remember her very fondly and um, she definitely had a teacher's spirit. <laughs> um, and so I, I did not know, however, that she um, she taught or that she was a counselor as well. How did that journey go for her? Is there any um, are there any stories that you recall uh, in, in the in the process of her teaching or in the uh, over the years of her teaching or counseling um, mm -hmm. that you would like to lift? Mm -hmm. Well, the when she was at Mooresville High School and the uh, the Southern Association Evaluation Committee came to visit, and uh, the lady in charge made the comment, and she said that the biology lab, and of course, Mr. Phillips and some other people were involved with it, and she came in and she interviewed Margie and she just picked a person to interview. And she said the laboratory that these people had set up is like a college laboratory. And, you know, that was great and everything. And uh, in one of the meetings, uh, the principal was making a good comment about it. And uh, he mentioned the, the, the the biology teachers and even mentioned when Sister Ella was there. Um, and Mr. Phillips and Ella, who was the other man? Um, I can't think of what his name was, but I know it was Mr. Phillips was one of them. And, uh, but anyway, he was, he was congratulating them and Margie looked around and, and nobody, she thought maybe they would say something about one of them, one of the white teachers, but they didn't say anything or applaud or anything for either one of them. Her experience in Mooresville actually, and this is in her own words, she said she had more respect in Mooresville than she did when she moved to Statesville. Now, that says something about the students in Mooresville, black and white. And it says something about the, the community. And uh, all the good people, uh, Reverend Moore and all those, and Reverend Kay Gamble that came later at the church, and uh, the Campbells that she lived with, uh, and she and Ella, uh, Ike and Mamie Campbell, if you guys remember them, great people. And uh, she just had a great experience. And the only negative things I ever heard her talk about in the education was when she got to Statesville, where we live. But even with all that, uh, when Margie, as, as Reverend was asking, she, was a, she became a counselor at Statesville High School. And she uh, got involved with uh, several things there. And uh, she would come home and she would tell me about how she was treated sometimes. And uh, she didn't give me any, any names because I didn't know the people anyway. But uh, she carried on and I think she got involved with the uh, student council. And, and a lot of the kids, 
liked her because she said that they said that she liked students. And Margie loved me, and I believe she met, loved most people that she met. Uh, I'm just fortunate that I was able to live with her uh, for about 51 years. Amen. Amen. Miss Ella, I'm going to uh, go ahead and bring you in because it seems like you were good friends with her as well. Um, could you uh, say your name, uh, the year you were born, and where you grew up? Okay. Um, before I do that, uh, the I think the name Jonathan was looking for is Mr. Nanny. Is that the name? I think it's the name he was looking for when he was talking about the people giving the uh, reviews. He said Mr. Phillips, and I think he might have meant Mr. Nanny. But anyway, yeah, okay. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Nanny was the principal. Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, my name is Ella Bradford, Ella Abram Bradford, and um, I was born in 1946, March 7th, in Sumter, South Carolina. Grew up here in Sumter, graduated from Lincoln High. No, well, I'm not here. I'm not in Sumter anymore. <laughs> Grew up in Sumter. Um, graduated from Lincoln High School in 1963. Went to Barber Scotia and graduated from Barber Scotia in biology along with Margie in 1967. And I did go to a &T, Jonathan. I am an Aggie. Yes, so is Brad. But anyway, um, yeah, we went to, Marge and I worked in Mooresville. Um, I worked from 1967 to 1960, so 67, 68, 68, 69. I left at the end of, six, the, end of the school year, 68, 69. Um, we worked in biology together and we lived with the Campbells, uh, Mrs. Mr. Isaac and Mrs. Mamie Campbell. They were lovely people. And we worshiped with them at the uh, Jerusalem Baptist Church. Uh, that's a very funny story. Both Marge and, I, Marge and I were Presbyterians. Okay, so we, when we first got to Mooresville, our first Sunday, we went to the Presbyterian Church. And when we, the second Sunday, because our, our um, hosts and, and landlords were Baptists, we decided to go to their church. So we went and Mr. Eichen stood up in the church and he was a deacon. And he said, we have Miss Carruthers and Miss Abram with us. And they are the new teachers at Mooresville Senior High School. Oh, and Miss Abram said, she's gonna play for us for, for the rest of this year. He had not said a thing to me about it, but there I was and there I did, I did my best. <laughs> um, we had a wonderful time at, at Mooresville. Um, you may ask, and, and Jonathan has said, the community. I think, I think the community of Mooresville had seen how ugly other places started their, their integration process. And I think they decided, hey, you know what? We're not going to be these people. We're, we're, that's not the road we're going to travel. So, um, the superintendent who was Mr. Morgan, he came over to Barbara Scotia and interviewed the entire science department. Apparently he was looking for science teachers, biology teachers. So he, he interviewed the department and he sat and talked with us. We talked back and forth, back and forth. And at the end of the night, he offered jobs. You know, if you're interested, call. And so Marge and I, I guess, I don't know, we didn't do it together, but we ended up going to Mooresville. And the district had to be very um, interested because they gave us Mr. and Mrs. Campbell's name as far as landlords. And they helped us find transportation to school because neither of us had a car. I think Mrs. Oh, don't let me get her name wrong. Mrs. Um, Parrott, I think Mrs. Parrott. Yeah. Drove down the main drag. And so we walked from Miss Campbell's house, which was about what, two blocks, maybe two or three blocks every morning. And we, um, she picked us up and took us on to school. And we did that for a month. Then we got paid. <laughs> and the funny thing about it, 
Mr. Ike, bless his heart, Mr. Ike and Ms. Campbell were upstanding citizens in the city of Mooresville. Let me tell you that. Everybody respected them. Mr. Ike, we told Mr. Ike, Mr. Ike, we need a car. He said, baby, go look and see what you want. So there was a car dealership on the block. We went down, we looked. One Sunday afternoon, we went back, Mr. Mar Mr. Ike said, well, did you see anything you liked? And we said, oh yeah, knew nothing about cars. He said, oh, there's a pretty, we said, there's a pretty Chevrolet. Oh, it's beautiful. I think it was a 58 Chevrolet. I'm not sure. I think maybe 58. 66. 50, 56. Oh, okay. It was 56 Chevrolet. All right. It, it was beautiful. 60, it was 66. 66. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. I know nothing about cars. Anyway, it was a 66 Chevrolet. And we told Mr. Ike when we came home the next day, the car was in the driveway. We hadn't gone and talked to anybody. Mr. Ike went, got the car, brought it. The car was there. It was ours. And I'm sure we probably went and did some paperwork later on, but that's just how nice of a man he was. So <laughs> anyway, um, as far as the school, I, I went through the yearbook today and, and if you want some figures and names, I can give you some names of students who were in these classes. Are you interested in that? Okay, Absolutely. in the in the class of sixty eight, there were three black students that I could see looking at the pages. Roughly, there were one hundred twenty five students on the um, commencement exercises. I counted them one hundred twenty five. Of those one hundred twenty five, there was Samuel Allen Campbell, Ronnie Glenn Hooper, and Janice Nixon. They were the senior black seniors. Um, Ronnie Hooper, by the way, was the co-captain co of the basketball team. Okay. That's actually Jan my uncle. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> Janice Nixon was, um, she was on the girls' basketball team. And, and I'm going to okay. say this, uh, uh, Ronnie's also my neighbor. <laughs> well, tell him I said hello. <laughs> Okay, from the class from the class of 69, these were the juniors, there was roughly 119 students. Of that 119, there were seven blacks. James Graham, Conrad Adams, Frank Caldwell, Conrad Campbell, Walter Graham, Moray Hawkins, and Thurman Houston. Okay. Um, Moray, um, pardon? Thurman, Thurman is one of our commissioners now. Okay, okay, all right. And from the class of 1970, they would have been freshmen. Of that group, there was a hundred, roughly 146, and there were six Blacks. Bernard Johnson, Tommy Mitchell, Cynthia Palmer, Glenda Pyatt, Kay Ship and Paula Stewart. Um, in the activities, let's see, we had uh, basketball, Ronnie Hooper was co-captain and Walter Graham played. In the girls basketball, Janice Nixon was on the team. Uh, let's see, we had in the French club, we had Glenda Pyatt, a freshman and Moray Hawkins, she was a junior at the time. Uh, in the band, we had Cynthia Palmer. She played wood, woodwind, and Janice Nixon played brass. Uh, in the monogram club, which is the boys' monogram, that's the sports guys, Ronnie Hooper, of course. Um, and then the, Ronnie Hooper, Alexander Campbell, and Thur Thurman Houston were in the Spanish club. And Margie and I, along with Mr. Phillips, we sponsored the science club. And there you have it. Now, I don't really know very much about the um, the goings on. I'm sure we, I'm sure we were involved in stuff, but we were so focused on getting 
our jobs right, we had to represent Barbara Scotia. We had to represent our homes. We had to represent the black community of Mooresville. We had to do good. So we, we, um, we had no life except for the classroom, going home, church. That was basically it. And it took us, I mean, my, my first two years, I worked, I worked very hard. Uh, I had four years of, four classes of, of biology. My first year there, I taught democracy and something. That was not my strong suit. So, you know, I worked three and four hours and five hours a night just for one hour of teaching, <laughs> but I had to get it right. The second year, I had four classes of biology and uh, science, uh, physical science. And one, one of the courses, one of, one of the chapters in physical science that I taught was on cars and engines. And I had to learn about pistons and, and um, uh, you know, how uh, the camshaft and all that stuff of a car. I don't know cars, but I had to teach it. I read that chapter. I'm sure five times and nothing stood out to me. But I think there was a fireman and I think he was from Troutman. I'm not sure, um, what do we call him? Um, hmm, can't think of his name right now. But he stopped by the house one Saturday afternoon and I just casually asked him about it and he started talking and I pulled the napkins and I started scribbling on napkins and I took, I took that stack of napkins with me to the classroom and I pulled them out and I taught that lesson from those napkins. And one of the, one of the young men in the class, Campbell, he, he worked at a service station, so he knew cars. He said, at the end of the class, he said, Miss Abram, that was right. And listen, that was a hallelujah moment. <laughs> I, whew. That was a hallelujah moment. When I got his okay, I was all right. I was all right. But anyway, can, that, that's basically how it went. Can I also add to that, that mm -hmm. uh, Sonetta was one of Marjorie's students mm -hmm. in there. And I had a little joke that I forgot to say. Uh, one day that Miss Ella and Margie went to Pike's service station and they had a flat, they had a tire that was needed to be changed. And I think it was, I'm not sure if it was Margie or Ella, but they asked Mr. Pike if he had a love L-O-V-E wrench. <laughs> <laughs> and so according to Margie, Pike got on his knees and he couldn't get up. He was laughing so hard. <laughs> Funny. <laughs> We didn't know cars. <laughs> <laughs> wow. We talked at class about it. <laughs> Indeed. Backing up a bit to, to cars, was the dealership that you received the car, was that integrated as well? At, or was that a segregated? It was downtown, um, almost in the center of town. It was probably predominantly owned by whites, I'm going to assume. I'm going to assume, like I said, we were the only two black teachers at, at uh, Mooresville Senior High School. We couldn't get away with nothing. <laughs> but, but just the idea that Mr. I just went down and, and you know, pointed it out and, and explained to them and they just gave him the keys and I was blown away. But I had another situation. We wanted a stereo and I don't miss, we, we told Miss Campbell we wanted a stereo. Miss Campbell went out and the next whatever day it was, she came back that we got home from work. There was this beautiful stereo and one Aretha Franklin record, 45. We played, baby, 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 sweet baby. We played that thing until it was all. <laughs> and finally, after about a month, we turned it over. Well, baby, baby, baby was the hot thing that time. We turned it over and on the other side was natural woman. Can you believe? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So you were the only two black teachers at Morrisville High School. The first that, two as well? We were not. We, there was a gentleman before us, the year before us. Okay. He was a shop teacher and I don't know his name. 
But if you were to go to the library and get the pitchfork and look for uh, the year 1967, I'm sure you can find them. Okay. But yes. And 67 was the first year of integration in Morrisville, is that correct? It must be 66, 66, 67. And the year, the, the yearbook for 66, for 67 would give you the, so it had to be 66. Okay. That was the first year. And th that same gentleman lived with the Campbells. And so we wow. came in, we came in 67, 68. Yeah. And I stayed 68, 69. Okay. What, um, before we bring uh, Mr. Sloan in, what can any of you tell me um, more about the Campbells that that you all lived with? Uh, they seem like quite uh, quite the couple. What more can you tell me rather? How do you describe them? They, they were just two beautiful people. Um, <laughs> Mr. Wright came home one day and he said, I just don't know what I'm gonna do. Um, Mrs. Campbell said, what you talking about, I, she said, he said, I want to go to um, some member's funeral. He said, but I don't think my boss will let me get off. She said, why not? He said, I, I, I don't think you have any more relatives. <laughs> I've asked for so, I've asked to be off so much for relatives. I, I think all your people are dead. <laughs> so <laughs> that tells you right there, you know, he was, he was that kind of person. Um, they were, they were beautiful. She loved to fish and, and he just, he was just a lovely person. <laughs> did, did they only, um, were they only, uh, landowners or what else did they do for a living? He worked at the, um, railroad railroads and she okay. worked what I'm, I'm thinking she worked at a factory someplace, but I'm not sure. Wherever she worked, somehow she could get on her way home. She didn't mind stopping by and fishing. That lady loved to fish. <laughs> and she's a good cook. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, let me tell you about cooking. <laughs> One Saturday, I decided to help them. I wanted to help Miss Campbell in the kitchen. So I said, let me make the biscuits. I know how to make biscuits. She says, OK, baby, come on. So I made the biscuits. What I didn't know was that the flour was not self-rising. <laughs> and the biscuits came out all flat and hard. And Mr. Ike said, mm, oh, honey, these are some good biscuits. <laughs> Miss Campbell said, Ike, stop lying. You know those biscuits will break your teeth. <laughs> they were just, they were beautiful. Well, did, uh, tell me, did uh, you remember Miss Mamie? Uh, I used to go over there a lot with Reverend Gamble, and then before then, I would just go over there sometimes to sit and talk with her. That was after <clears throat> Mr. Ike had passed away. Uh, did she have a, a wooden rocking chair that she sat in? And did you remember uh, she had a wooden rocking chair? Yeah, she did. She, she, yeah. Um, some weekends they would keep their grand, their first grand, um, junior. We were there when Junior was just a baby. And we, Marjorie and I, when we played this baby baby, we would dance Junior around the floor. <laughs> Sometimes dance him to sleep with baby, baby, baby. Ju I think Junior may live there in their house now. Is, isn't his, wasn't his name Pinky? Didn't they call him Pinky? I don't know. He was, he was so small when I left until they were just, I guess they, would, they hadn't given him a, a, a nickname. You know, but Miss Ella, do you remember the address? I want to say four twenty five Westmore. That's I live here on Westmore now. I'm okay. three six three. Yes, so the house is still there, but um, it's been it's sold. So someone else is in there now. Okay, okay. Yeah. And across the street from them were the Jamesons. You rem remember the Jamesons? No, I was the, um, the Clarks, Irene and James Clark at the top of the hill. Okay. okay. That was my grandparents, but that's where I live now, right above um, where Miss Mamie used to stay. Okay. And my, my grandfather, uh, James Campbell, he lived right next door to the Jamesons. Okay. Right. And they were related 
the James and Mamie and, and Ike. Ike. Yes. Okay. Craig, your grandfather, he is he ran a a, a cleaners. A dry cleaners and troutman. Campbell's and, cleaners. And he he um picked up cleanings and you know, I believe your grandfather introduced Jonathan and Clint to us. Jonathan. Yeah, and, and my mother worked at the cleaners as well. Uh, okay. Rebecca Sloan, she worked at the dry cleaners. I think your grandfather, because he used to come all the way to Statesville when we moved to Statesville that second year, uh -huh. he would come and drop off our dry cleaning and pick it up. And he was the one, he says, I know two young men, two nice young men. I'm going to introduce y'all to Jonathan. Craig's yeah. grandfather is responsible for you and Marge getting together. Wow. And, and one of his, one of his uh, workers now owns a funeral home in, in uh, Mooresville. Uh, it's uh, over there above the old police department. Bryant. Bryant Light on Young. Bryant, or, uh, yeah. It's not Bryant because Bryant was close to. Yeah, where Bryant was, was the next. Well, there was one house that was the Fairs, Ronald Fairs family. And mm -hmm. then there was Bryant Light on Young Funeral Home on the corner. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, now, the only other black funeral home in Moors was Clyburn, right? Yes, Clyburn. Clyburn also worked uh, delivering the, <laughs> the. He was delivering the uh, dry cleaning. So I think both of us, both of them, came by and introduced us. Mister Mister Campbell was a great man. Yeah, and so actually. Uh, the, the man with that that funeral home worked for him. Okay. Part time. Okay. It's interesting. Wow. Yeah, he used to drive a, a blue uh, station wagon. Yeah. That was what he picked the clothes up in. Yeah. A, a blue station wagon. Uh, 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 Reverend Gabriel, uh, Craig, the book that I gave you uh, to read. Uh, about Mr. Jimmy Campbell, Craig is, Mr. Jimmy is Craig's grandfather. Mm -hmm. So it's a coincidence that, that we got him here. Uh, Craig, Amen. we both oh, just read, we both have read Mr. Jimmy's book. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Pastor Dave, is... before we, I'm gonna say, before we go to Craig, can I say something about um, Ms. Byers, please? Absolutely. We're coming back I'm, as well. Okay. <laughs> All right. I didn't want to get off of them and we move on. But um, Ms. Carruthers taught my mom at Mooresville. And then when I came there in um, 88, no, I graduated in 88. So I came where we were 86, 85. Um, she was my science teacher. And then she, of course, I was on student government, student government president, um, science club president. So and Mr. Byers, I'm sure you've heard all kinds of stories. She's talked about me, but she was my angel, my rock. She did uh, introduce me to Barbara Scotia College. So I had my degree there. I graduated from Scotia in 92. And this lady just, she was the everything to me. And she meant so much to me and to other students too. But I know I was that special one. <laughs> But um, you were. her teaching, <laughs> thank you. Her teaching um, as if she took us under, we were her babies and you were wrong. She told you you were wrong, you were right. She built you up and made you think that you, you were right. And it was just, she was an amazing person. And um, I'm glad you shared her with us. And um, it was just, you know, I, I'm so grateful and I'm so to, honored to see you tonight because I hadn't seen you since her passing in 2020. But um, she is a big responsibility of who I am as a woman, as a mother, as a person. Um, Margie Carruther Byers, um, my angel. Thank well, you. Well, I'd, I'd like to add something to uh, one of the funny things. I came home one time and Margie had uh, some uh, pigs 
that had been a couple of little small pigs that had been uh, sexist, what do you call, do you call it? Dissected. Dissected, sad. And I asked, I said, what is this? She said, that's just a couple of little pigs. There's nothing wrong, you know. And uh, so then she, get, she did it two other times. So I made sure I made a space in the refrigerator for her pigs and whatever else she brought. And, uh, but it was funny and, they, and that was before the children uh, got very old enough to know what was going on. I know they would have had a lot of fun with that. <laughs> yeah, we did pigs and frogs and frogs. worms. And a cat oh one time. Oh, that formaldehyde, I remember the smell right now. <laughs> So yeah, it was a, just a great person. And she loved her family and she she loved all the students, black and white. And yes, the respect of her, I don't think no one saw color. I mean, she just told it like it was. And the staff, they respected her. The students, they loved her. And um, she was, I guess she was my lifesaver because I was not going to school. I was college was not in my <laughs> uh, vision at the time. And uh, she pulled me inside and said, you know, let's try this. Let's just go and see. And um, 92, I came out with my degree in business administration, concentration, hospitality management. So, thank you. Amen. Hey, I got one question to ask Mr. Byers. Mr. Byers, you said you go uh, St. James, I think it was, St. James, uh, right. Uh, right over there off of uh, Perth Road. Yeah, yeah, Perth and Judith. Oh, yeah, Judith, Judith Road, yeah. Uh, right down from where Mr. Vance Nail and uh, uh, yeah. was living. And uh, in that area there, uh, uh, that was also called, a, a, well, I don't know if it was a part of Neotown, but it was called Neotown, I think, back in, in well, early days. I don't, I don't know how long uh, St. James has been there now on that corner. How long has St. James been there on that corner? Do you know? Uh, it's uh, the first building burned down, but it started out there in 1874. And the building that they're in now that's been expanded was 1952. Yeah, it's been okay. there for quite a while. 1874, we got to figure that one out, you all. Uh, 148, I think. 148 years. Okay. Well, I'm not mistaken. I could have done that wrong. Yeah. But um, I did. So at when um, the two of you were teaching at Morrisville High School in the beginning, uh, were you the, you the only biology teachers at the time? So the entire biology department was ran by Black women at in the late 60s. Mr. Phillips was uh, still there, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. Do you remember? The white man. He was the okay. one white man. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about Richard Lauder? Was he there at that time? Mr. Lauder. His wife there, was there. There was yeah. a Mrs. Elizabeth Lauder. She taught general okay, she business. Was English, right? Yeah. General business and typing. Okay. I will say um, from from working with the Morrisville Greatest School District now and, and working alongside Morrisville High School, they pride themselves on being on the the front end of uh, of, you know, classroom design and and curriculum and whatnot. It sounds as though they were back then. Have they maintained that over the years um, from your lens? I think they've gotten better. I really do. I mean, I was I always worked in the Iredale County or Iredale Statesville, but I have to give it to Mooresville. Uh, there was a lot of innovation going on. And uh, some of the former students like, uh, let's see, the, the young man, Mr. Houston. Mm -hmm. When those guys, guys got out of high school, him and some other guys, uh, they they banged on the doors of the city county town hall and said, "We want to do some stuff." And the, the the white people finally started listening to them, and 
And they actually now seek out people from the uh, black community to get involved in government. They do. I will agree there. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I was one that uh, went to Moors of the first year in 66 when they uh, integrated. And uh, I can say that, uh, but they say the main of you for last. Okay. But I yes. can say <laughs> it, was, it was not pretty uh, when uh, we went there when we first, the first year we got there. Uh, with Miss Nanny and uh, and some of us kind of told Miss Nanny about it later on in in life. Uh, but when we seen him, he was of some age. But so maybe maybe your first year, maybe you made it better for us when we got there a second year. Maybe we didn't. Maybe we didn't see, you know, because you had paved, you know, gotten okay. some of the kinks out. Yeah. Yeah. I think that that's what had happened because uh, it wasn't pretty the first year. It was a lot of uh, name calling, a lot of uh, teachers was picking on a lot of the minority kids. Uh, it, was, it was like a walk in the door just when the bell was ringing. They was, uh, it, was, it was pretty rough when we, the first year, but uh, we fought back and uh, I think uh, now things have changed. You asked if we were the only two biology teachers. I think we were, and then there was chemistry and physics under Mr. Phillips, who was also the assistant principal. That year, 67, 68, 68, 69. That's pretty powerful um, in the late 60s to, to, to be able to say that if you had biology, you had a black woman, regardless. Of, yeah, yeah. Of, how you looked at it and that I mean yeah so I'm, I'm glad I'm really glad to hear that about more so Mr. Sloan are you ready uh, neat. All yes, right. uh, okay my name is Craig Sloan uh, I'm originally from Mooresville um, I was born in October of 1959 I grew up on west end side of town uh, my mother's name was Rebecca Sloan uh, my father's name was Norris Graham, uh, who was the brother of Terry Graham who owned Terry's Taxi. Uh, and <clears throat> Rebecca Sloan was the daughter of James Campbell who owned Campbell's Cleaners. Uh, so we grew up uh, around a lot of business folks, black business folks. And uh, I was, we grew up in uh, Jones Chapel Baptist Church, which is now Campbell's Missionary Baptist Church uh, next to Woods School, which was Dunbar School at that time. Uh, I did the first and second grade at Dunbar School. And in the third grade, we would move to South School, which was located where there's a big Methodist church across from the cemetery on Center Street. Uh, that was where South School was located. And uh, as we grew up through school uh we made a lot of friends and and uh if you were to look at my facebook page or something now it's very uh diverse uh because a lot of the people that we started out with in the second grade was still very close uh until today uh, went on and joined the air force after graduation in 1978 uh, there was about six of us that left, and uh, five of us ended up retiring from the branches of service that we went into. Uh, so we were we were all very successful in our military careers. And I now live in Sumter, South Carolina. Uh, I work for the Department of the Army, and uh, I have you know a wife, uh, three children, uh, seven grandchildren and uh, have two old two older brothers, Dwight Sloan of Mooresville and Roger, William Roger Sloan of, uh, of Virginia, Northwest Virginia, Herndon. And uh, that's uh, pretty much my background. Is there a, I, I know that you both live in Sumter now, is there a tie from Mooresville to, to Sumter? No, like, uh, okay. 
Well, Miss Al is no longer here. She's moved away. Uh, we were members of the same church here, uh, Jehovah Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, and that's where we, we became friends. And she came to me one day and she said, you know, did I know Miss Mamie Campbell? And she talked about Cynthia, Miss Mamie Nim's daughter. And um, we, we, we talked and said, yeah, I, I know a lot of the same people. Uh, I'm not sure what came up that said that I was from Mooresville, but it, uh, it initiated the conversation. Just this whole world and all of a sudden we end up in Sumter, South Carolina talking about Mooresville. Well, the, the, the Sloans and the Campbells. Oh, so, go ahead. <laughs> my son is the one, my son told us that um, my son knew Craig or met Craig before I did. And he told Craig that, yeah, my mother was in Mooresville. And I right. think that's how we, that's or how he we told me. <laughs> And if, if you guys ever need a great minister to speak, her son is outstanding. Noted. <laughs> we, um, all of you have some sort of, of tied to Jerusalem Baptist Church. Uh, it sounds like where Reverend Moore was when um, you likely had association there. Um, I know Sam Sloan. Yes. Uh, was the head of the deacon board there. Um, what do you remember about Reverend, Reverend Moore? Now, I, I didn't know much about Reverend Moore because like I said, I went to Jones Chapel Baptist Church. Now we would go, my aunt Grace, Grace Adams, uh, who was James Campbell's uh, sister. Uh, she, uh, at that time, uh, she was Grace, Hmm. Grace Corner. She was Grace Corner at that time. And uh, Ms. Uh, Uncle James Corner, he passed away and she later remarried to uh, James Adams. She was Grace Corner. Now she attended Jerusalem and we would go to Jerusalem periodically with her, but we were at, at Jones Chapel Baptist Church. So I would see Reverend Moore, but I really didn't. Uh, worship unto him. I have a question for you, Greg. Uh, tell us what you know about the uh, Sunday school. They used to call them picnics back back in the days when we all used to get together on the buses, the Gable, or on the, Mr. Gable's buses and go up on those Sunday school picnics. Uh, you remember that? Yeah, those, those were always very exciting. Uh, first off, you got a new outfit. Uh, and you knew you were going somewhere where there was a swimming pool and there was gym equipment and playgrounds and everything. And you'd pack a, a pretty good lunch and uh, you'd leave early in the morning and you'd come back late at night. And it was a, it was a day of adventure. We would go to Winston-Salem or I remember one trip to High Point. And uh, when I was growing up and, and started driving, I wanted to go to High Point and find this park uh, that we had went when we were uh, very young. Uh, yeah, the Sunday school picnics were, I mean, they were very, very important to the community. And each church would have a different uh, weekend that they would go and, and they, would let, they would let you go. You know, you could go with the different churches and stuff. And it was just a lot of fun, a great community uh, event and activity. It was unbelievable. You know, and we have to thank uh, Reverend McKenzie for putting that on. Uh, you know, uh, was, he was the one that was responsible. It seemed like to me, he was the one that kept the, uh, all of the churches working together. Mm -hmm. that's, that's very true. Yeah. Now, Reverend McKenzie was at the Presbyterian Church myself. I don't think I knew that. Um, so, so you graduated from Mooresville in 78? That's correct. Um, did Miss uh, Miss Ella or, or Miss Margie teach you? Yes. Or you I, was in, okay. I was in Miss Byers' class and, and I was the treasurer of the student council one year. And uh, I shared the story the other day with Kirk. I, I was the treasurer and we had uh, an event. It was the teacher's donkey basketball or something. 
Mm -hmm. And at the end of the event, as the treasurer, I had to split up the money in certain percentages that were going to pay the people that put the event on, that was going to pay the school, that was going to pay the custodians. And I really didn't know how to do the percentage. And Miss Byers, you know, she had this way of working with you. She never wanted to embarrass you or anything like that. So she came over and she helped me out. She bailed me out, really. And she whispered in my ear, you meet me at my class at such and such time, and I'm going to teach you how to do these percentages. This will never happen to you again. And uh, from that day forward, I've never had a problem with percentages. <laughs> and so that's that's my Miss Byers story. But she was she was just a, a, a beautiful, she had a beautiful spirit. And uh, everyone in the class, all the black students, the white students, and everyone just loved her. And uh, and you know, she was just she was a very amazing lady. Man. Are there any um, stories, Miss Ella, that you remember? Um, I know you said that the, 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 it seems as though, and we've heard this pretty pretty much across the board, that Morsel, um, they, they saw the other integration stories and uh, it looks, it seemed as though they just said, you know, this isn't gonna be us. Are there any stories with the students that, that would say otherwise? I know that oftentimes that's the case with administration and maybe even your coworkers, but, students don't always respond that way. I don't remember any um, student, you know, negative. Um, it's been a long time. And I don't, maybe if it happened, maybe, you know, you want to forget the things that are ugly. But I, I really don't remember. I honestly don't. And, um, and, and maybe, you know, attitude is a lot. Maybe I just... Maybe I just had a positive attitude and, you know, th this has got to work. You know how you go in, this has got to work. I just got to pull out all the stops. This has got to work. I, I just, I don't have a negative, you know. I think it, now I'm sure it wasn't all cookies and cream, you know, <laughs> but on the surface, I think, and, and maybe they just respected us enough not to, you know, show their true colors. Likewise, Mr. Byers. Well, <clears throat> I heard one of her students, and maybe Shanetta can verify this. Uh, and this was a white girl. And this young lady said, Miss Byers, I believe you love all students. Um, also, that first year that uh, Miss Ella and Margie worked at Mooresville, there were a few people that would that that would do some condescending statements, and Margie said it, it seemed to her that after a while they saw that Ella and Margie were not going to pay any attention to it. So guess what? They quit doing that. As far as intimidation, uh, sometimes you just have to not necessarily turn the other cheek, but just stay focused. And, and Margie not only did that at school, but she did that at home. She wanted us to stay focused. And as I said about Ella, Ella and Margie were just like two peas in a pod. Those girls, they were just genuine. And I don't think I ever saw uh, this Ella angry. Now I've seen Margie angry, <laughs> but but uh, but in in public I've never seen. And even my wife, I mean, they just, just let things slide over. Even at my church, when Margie came to my church at St. James, uh, excuse me, Reverend Gavin, by saying it this way, some of my people 
were upset because I didn't marry a local girl. Why did you have to go all the way to Charlotte to get a wife? And so some of the ladies, and these are all black ladies, they gave her a hard time. And uh, so as Margie told me, people are just people. There's some dumb uh, people that look like this, and there's some dumb people that look like this. Indeed. Yeah. Mr. Sloan, you've got uh, connections to almost, I mean, ha half of the, the Black businesses uh, <laughs> that were around in Mooresville in the, in the 60s and 70s, it sounds like. So uh, what do you remember or has that influenced you in any way um, as an adult, you know, growing up around, around those? Um, it did influence me as because the Air Force afforded me the opportunity to travel and go a lot of places all over the world and meet a lot of different people. And it just basically taught me that each person uh, can do uh, what they want to do if that's really what they want to do. And uh, I watched how, you know, the different businesses went through the different challenges. Uh, I would ride sometime in the taxi with my dad. Um, when he would pick up the mill workers and the some of the elderly people and take them to cash their checks and things uh, and then i would go up on the, go on saturdays go up to the cleaners and i would have to do something as small as folding the collars on the shirt and putting the cardboard under um, and it just taught you that sometimes the small tedious things are just as important as the big things so when I joined the Air Force and they wanted you to fold a T-shirt to six inches uh, before you could put it in the drawer, that was, you know, that wasn't that big of a deal. So it, it just kind of prepared me for a lot of the challenges that you see out in the world. Do you remember anything um, more, any of you, do you remember anything more about the uh, Black businesses in Morsel? Um before before 1980 or so? That was a lot. I mean, you had the barbershops, you had uh, several gas stations. Uh, Pike had his gas station. You had uh, Dukes had their gas station, which was up on the corner uh, close to Whataburger. Uh, and then right behind Dukes, there was a hair salon uh, that was black owned. And you had Friendly Barbershop down on West End. Uh, and right behind it, you had Miss Virginia Knox. She did, uh, she had a beauty salon. Uh, you know, we we didn't have any black firemen. I remember that. There was never a black fireman while I was growing up, but we had black police officers, Tommy Cross, uh, Ben Griffith was a, a sheriff. Uh, we had uh, Richard Hall, he was a police officer and Freddie Cornelius was a police officer for a short period of time. So there was just a, you know, there was a good variety of, of different people around town that were setting good examples for young people to watch and to emulate. Uh, was had a question, was Will Knox um, a sheriff deputy or did he ever work in Morrisville? Uh, I remember Will Knox the name, um, but I'm not sure what position he held. Yeah, but he 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 was a part part of uh, some some type of law enforcement. Yeah, Reverend Jonathan. Johnson. Oh, excuse me. We had a friend, Pete. He was a fireman. Where was he a fireman in Statesville? Yes. Oh, in Statesville. Okay. He was in Statesville. Yeah. He's the one that taught me that unit on. <laughs> on the car engine. That's when you're all in, uh, out there in the little mobile home. And... Yeah, yeah, it was the second year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, well, Mr. Uh, Sloan, go I'm sorry, Kurt, go ahead. Uh, you, uh, Mr. Sloan, I wanted to um, say that your father was also instrumental in my 
growing up. I rode the cab from kindergarten to fourth grade. <laughs> um, and so I had to sit there with him and listen. And, and so I was the, the monitor of the taxi. So he had me in charge of all the other kids. I guess <laughs> I was always probably the largest. So I was always the leader. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, Mr. Norris, he, for four years, I rode the cab with him. I'm Laureen Clark's daughter. Okay. All right. So, and um, we, all those years, we had one accident <laughs> um, <laughs> coming across by Cook's um, railroad track. But yeah, okay. I remember him well. And I went to Morris Chapel with him also. Okay, so, great. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. your dad was very uh, instrumental and, in, uh, you know, in my growing up also. Great. Thank you. And also, uh, Craig, I find myself doing what he used to do as well as being president of the NWZP. Uh, right. Everybody used to sit back and wait on, you know, they they knew if they seen him coming knocking at the door, it was time to pay your dues. Time to pay your dues. Because <laughs> he was he was the commander at the American Legion post for a while as well. Yeah. And uh, the president of NAACP. And, uh, he held quite a few positions. Well, if we don't have any... Oh, sorry, I was... Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. I don't believe I've asked this before, but uh, Terry Taxi, uh, the, the Vandenbergs worked for them as well, right? Or Yes. Yeah, the Va Vandenberg... Uh, our mother, our, our grandmother, uh, she was a Vandenberg. So okay. that, that was the tie with the Vandenbergs. Was the taxi company at the time, and maybe this changed over the years, but it, were they just for us? Were they just for Black folk or, or did they take everybody? Okay. He took everyone. Yeah, he took everyone. Yeah. Were there other taxi companies? Like white? Yes. Okay. There were, there was what, Grady's uh, taxi was in Mooresville. Uh, hmm. yeah, George. Yeah, George's and uh, and and Terry. Uh, Uncle Terry, he wrote a very interesting article back in the late '60s uh, about the expansion and the growth of Mooresville. Uh, I'll try to find it online again. Uh, I copied it, but I, it's online. And and his concern was that Mooresville was growing and that the black community was going to be left behind. Uh, because at the time, uh, he felt like a, a lot of the Black folks weren't doing the things that were necessary and getting involved in some of the things that were necessary uh, to be a part of that growth that was uh, prepared. He was the first person I ever heard talk about a town's 15-year plan, and, uh, and he was familiar with that, and he was just encouraging folks to become aware of that. Uh, and uh, I'm sure he had a lot of uh, mentoring with Thurman, because Thurman's one of our cousins, and uh, and uh, he probably talked with him about a lot of the stuff that was going to happen uh, in the future. But he was very concerned about how, if we weren't careful, we would get left behind. And wow. all these years later, do any of you feel like that is what happened? When you, when you leave Mooresville for a while, uh, for me, it's been 44 years, uh, and you go back, uh, there are some things that do concern me. Uh, the, the young people seem to be emulating a little too much instead of uh, wanting to be individuals and wanting to have their own goals. Uh, and going for those goals. Uh, and over a long period of time, that can probably get you in a little bit of trouble uh, because you can lose your way uh, because you haven't decided what it is that you want to do. Uh, so I think, I think in, in some ways, a lot of the young people have not uh, aspired to their goals and have become caught up in, in a negative system because they never decided what it was that they as individuals wanted to do. Wow, 
that was very powerful. That 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 was very powerful. And uh, I think you mentioned to me about that uh, article, and I said I, I, that we we would love to get a copy of that article mm -hmm. if we could, uh, because what you said right there uh, is um, very powerful. I, I, I've said the same thing mm -hmm. that. Uh, uh, we had the Elks home because we lost it. We're like interest, we had the American Legion Post here and we lost it. For lack of interest, we had the Dunbar alumni uh, lost it because of lack of interest. So your dad was kind. I mean, uh, your uh, your dad was kind of like Nostradamus. He was uh, kind of predicting what was coming uh, ahead, and uh, a lot of people didn't see it, but I see it, and I. I I, uh, I see it because this is why this documentary means so much to me because I have compassion because I see it happening. I see it happening. Uh, back in the 1960s when I learned uh, those who was here teaching, we probably had a population of probably 6,000 people, six or 7,000. In 2022, we have a population of 54,000, uh, and uh, Moors will have grown with uh, other races, but with minorities, uh, we're growing there. But uh, like the ones from Moors, we going the opposite direction. And uh, years ago, Statesville was the biggest city uh, in Idaho County, but now. Moors is almost twice the size of Statesville. Statesville sitting at uh, 28,000, but they still have the Elves. They still have the uh, 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 Unity alumni. They still have the uh, American Legion Post. Uh, they're still doing things there, but Moors will just uh, seem like they're, uh, when it comes to minorities, they're just, I heard one lady tell us in the documentary, they have traded a credit card for the own race. Could I add something about Mooresville that it's to be proud of? Um, I happen to be on the one of the trustees on the uh, trustee board for Mitchell Community College. And the director of the Mooresville campus is a black lady. And there are several black folks that have been added, but I see the concern from Mr. Johnson and other people that I know. And by the way, Mr. Norris Graham's wife went to my church. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about? And, yeah, that's Alice. Alice, yeah, Alice. Uh, but one of the things that sh this lady has found out is that she doesn't see many of the black students coming forward and even people wanting to uh, work for the college. Know what I'm saying? Because there are a lot of fine programs under this community college and, and as a black person, she's concerned about uh, a lot of people just seem to be satis satisfied with the status quo. That's a concern. Yes, that is a concern. And I will say that the NWCP, we tag team with uh, Mitchell, I mean, with uh, uh, Mike Cook at the Mike Cook funeral home. He's a life member of the NWCP. So he tag team with the NWCP. And we give away a $500 scholarship to any black kid that wants to go to Mitchell Community College. Uh -huh. and we've been doing this now for five years and we've only given away two scholarships. Uh, nobody comes forward, nobody steps up, nobody. And, and they'd rather go home and sit on the couch first and uh, take a two year college. In Stacefield, um, huh, the last year they gave. 12 scholarships for black, black students. Hmm. There's a need. 
I want to ask uh, a question just based off of some of the other interviews that we've done um, that may <laughs> may raise an unpopular decision. Sean, we'll probably have to edit this out, but I, I'm curious to your answers. Um, we have heard so many different types of Black folk uh, speak about Mooresville back in the day, and um, a lot of the the way that race went boils down to uh, well black people just understood their place like we didn't we didn't have any problems and it was a great time but we also didn't do certain things so that we, we would have a problem um in one in one way from my lens it, that would also um mirror what the the lack of um desire to to change things in Mooresville um, now in, in, in some way, shape, or form. You could see those two things as the same. Um, I, I have a feeling that most of you would not see that as the same. And so for that reason, um, what do you feel when it's stated that way is the difference in the Black community? I'll speak for myself. Um, I know Mr. Houston very well and several of the uh, black people, uh, male and female who are striving to improve things. But I'll use my family also as, as, as a way. It seemed that back when we were struggling people were yearning to gain or uh, to to gain some status they were buying land my grandfather bought a hundred acres on Byers Road below Troutman and <laughs> In my family, we're trying to get the younger folks to take some chances, to do some things, to go into business. My, my cousin Leonard Byers runs the Byers and Sons moving business. And I remember Mr. Graham and all the work that he did. And then looking at Mr. Sloan and Mr. Johnson, it's like sometimes in all of our communities, even Gavin, Reverend Gavin and your, your, your family, the Gabriels were cornerstones, okay? Now it's down to you and your father. You understand what I'm saying? And it's like, we don't find a lot of people who are yearning to do better. But I've heard this over and over. Mr. Houston would do that, or Mr. Johnson would do that. And it's like, in the day, everybody had a yearning to get better. Even if they had to leave the community and they went north, they were striving to make their situation better and to do more for the black race. But there seems to be a sense of complacency right now that is gonna bother, and I know it bothers Mr. Johnson and Mr. Sloan and, and several of us, that complacency is a real problem. And, and, and people like Shanetta and Reverend Gabriel a lot of folks are letting folks your ages just do it all. To me, that's one of the most hurtful things that, you know, we even quote sometimes, they takes a village. But in my experiences in a lot of communities right now, we don't believe in that anymore. We don't believe in the community. We don't believe in the village. What we believe in is picking the two or three or four people out and telling them to do everything. Am I speaking for myself? 
Wow. I completely that's, agree. That's wow. what I'm seeing. Very powerful. Very powerful. That that sums up pretty much the whole documentary, what we have gathered over the, the weeks. I mean, this is powerful. It seems like the hope, the hope is lost. The hope is gone. It has to be rekindled. How do you do it? When Barack Obama became president, I think we were we decided that he was going to fix it, everything. But a president is just one, one person. And some of us thought that he was supposed to only work for black people. But in order to get stuff done, he had to work for the whole country. And I've heard people say, well, since Obama has, he's out, we don't have another chance. That kind of thinking bothers me immensely. It bothers me quite a bit. And on that, right. On that front, um, and I would like to hear from each of you. Uh, what do you remember about um, voting growing up um, in Aradale County or in the or in the Mooresville? What do you remember about uh, voter empowerment in Mooresville in your time here? Um, did you hear anything or do you, what do you crawl as your first time voting? I know that was a lot, but it's, it's all the same. <laughs> yeah. Well, since I'm babbling on here, uh, when I was young and my parents sometimes would be, you know, they would vote. And a lot of times my dad and mom would have a white friend to go with them to help. Them. And to keep the all the buzzards off. Them. And of course, uh, I know Mr. Johnson remembers the all, all of the churches, not some of them, but all of the churches, uh, the deacons and pastors and the, the missionary departments would say, I've got a car and anybody that wants to vote, just let me know and I'll, I'll carry you over to the voting pool. Um, even in my own church, I'm a deacon, and we have asked and asked and asked. And I found out in doing a survey that over the last few years, and we only have about 60 people now, we have one time had 120. But over the last five or six years, or 10 years, uh, in the survey, people have honestly told me 40% of our congregation does not vote. I hope, I hope Mooresville is doing better than that, but, but we had people lynched because they were trying to vote. We had people that were beaten down with chains and ropes and all kinds of stuff. The houses burned. I don't know we're looking for a great deliverer. And I know we say we believe in God, but we don't really practice it. We don't seem to actually do anything to make it better for ourselves and other people. I'm talking about as a whole. The hope, Ella, is just, it's dwindling. We're looking for somebody People are looking for somebody like Mr. Johnson and, and Sonetta and Gavin, Mr. Sloan to do all, all the work. We can't get there by on the backs of a few, a few people. We need to work as a village. Teacher. <laughs> That's all I can say, teach it. <laughs> because this is, and we want to hear from Miss Ella too, but this is and what we, yeah, and Miss and so, Craig, this is what we are hoping to do in this documentary is make it a teachable moment. Yeah. Teachable. We've got to teach the people yeah. through this documentary. Yeah. Okay, Miss Ella, go ahead. Yeah. Um, my first experience in voting. I had margin, I drove from Mooresville to Sumter, 
because that particular Friday would have been the last day for me to register. And we got there 15 minutes before closing and I was able to register. That was my first time to vote. Wow, yeah, we made it. But now as far as voting in Mooresville, I don't know anything about that, but I do know I got registered to vote. Ah, oh, yes. And you yeah. made a, a special trip to go. Oh yes. It wasn't that important to you. Oh yes. Oh yes. A Amen. Okay. Now, uh, uh, since we're on on the thing about hope, I I know this is completely off, and it's not registration. I mean, it's not voting or anything. But we're talking a lot about the the gun violence and stuff in communities, and I think the problem is if the gun violence will diminish if the hope increased. Our young people don't have anything to look forward to. They have no consciousness about life. They don't care about life. It's not important to them anymore because uh, I know I've got a lot of preachers on here, but God is, is not there. So they don't know about the sanctity of life. Mm -hmm. So there is no hope. And that's why you have gun violence. Well, one of the reasons. Here's the hope. This is their hope. And I know we can we can use the Bible on our computers and our phones, but I've almost run over 10 uh, people under 30 with my vehicle because I had a green light and they didn't even look up. They just came out, walked straight across while they were texting. My church is beginning to teach our young people about how to use this thing and not make it a crutch because in my community, we have lost about four people who've died because they were texting while driving or texting while walking. And with technology and Facebook, I've got a Facebook account. That's not my life. That's just something that I do to connect with, with the world. But I don't make it my life. I'm I want to ask one question myself. I, I noticed that most people never talk about downtown Mooresville. Mm -hmm. Can anybody tell me anything or any of their memories of downtown Mooresville? Hmm. I remember uh, when my wife was working in Mooresville, we would always go to, uh, it was either Spain Hours or Belks and Mrs. Uh, Bailey. Uh, Nick, you remember Mick Bailey? <laughs> His wife worked in there and she operated the um, elevator. And I remember several uh, black folks that would come in and they would shop and they catered that place because this person, this black lady was working in there. And um, And, and of course, with Margie working in Mooresville, a lot of times I would go through and we'd go through the shops and everything and people seemed to be friendly, but uh, after the 1980s, I didn't see any of us working in any stores downtown. And I don't know what happened, but before that I would see people Beside Mr. Mr. Uh, Graham and, and the uh, beauticians and so forth, but most of those people were in the black community, but downtown Mooresville, I just don't, I don't see any of us down there. But uh, a, a lot of good things are going on down there. Uh, it's the cotton, the artists, What's his name? He's he's a he's well world known as a painter now. Cotton Ketchy. 
Cotton Catchy. And Cotton Catchy um, has tried to do some teaching to some people, young guys that had art talent and uh, they had skills, but he couldn't get white or black guys to come on board to, to learn how to do it. It's not just us, it's not just us. It's just the, it's just the youth as a whole. Caucasians, it's the same thing. Um, I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm embarrassed in Statesville a lot of times because I don't see a lot of black guys or white guys working. I see him, Hispanic guys and I see Hispanic Black and Latino, Latino females working. I don't see the black guys working much. You know, my uh, my pastor uh, years ago, he told me he says uh, he was talking to some Indians. Uh, you know, these people that own most of these BP service stations. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And he said that he was talking to two of them. And the two that he was talking to said, they said, we don't understand your people. And he said, what do you mean? He said, we don't understand your people. Come on, they didn't understand the black race. Mm -hmm. They said, only thing you people want, your people want is a job. Why is it they just want jobs? Say, we come here, we want business. Why they don't want business? They just want a job. And say, we come here, we put a business in their job, in their area, and the only thing they want is a job. Why they don't want businesses? That, that was pretty heavy, I thought. Yeah. yeah. That's very heavy. Yeah. And unfortunately, like uh, Mr. Byers said, so many just don't even want jobs right now. Um, because it's not that the jobs are not available. We all see the hiring signs, <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I love my cousins, but they don't <laughs> want it. It's also unfortunate too, that a lot of times when they, we have businesses, we as a people don't cater to and don't support That's our true. brother's businesses. Mm -hmm. That is so true, so true. They did a job on us back in the day, when yep. they separate us and, and uh, how you, you, you uh, conquer people by separating the mind, they did a job on the minds of people. We got to get out of that. We yeah. got that's we got to reteach. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, I was uh, listening at a uh, uh, history scholar and he uh, said uh, he was in a crowd of over 500 white people and said uh, the question, he asked the question, how many of you all know where your ancestors was from? He said all of the white people in there, over 500 raised their hands. <clears throat> Not only did they know where their ancestors were from, they knew they was buried, they knew they nationality, I mean, the, the, the blood streams, the whole nine yards. And so he asked a group of 100 black people the same question and none of them could raise their hand. And he said the reason why, because back when they brought the blacks over, at first they was they was letting the families live together. Mm -hmm. The the father, the sons and the mothers and all of them live together as a family. And then they started getting rebellious to the master. Mm -hmm. And the master couldn't figure out what was going on. So they they hired the, some guy to come in and analyze what was happening. He said, the reason why they're starting to rebel against you because you're letting them stay together as families and they know the great, and their parents are telling them the greatness that they came from. And say, and, and said, and said, the only way that you're going to stop that is that when you bring them over here, you got to start separating them. And that bothers me really bad. That's the only thing about my Black history that bothers me, that we are still feeling the effects of that right to the day. We're still feeling the effects of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's hard yeah, to hear. I mean, 1865 was really not that long ago. It's in, in the grand scheme of things. Um, 
the generational trauma that we're dealing with, unfortunately, is expanding because not only do they not know who their people were before 1865, um, but so many of uh, my young peers uh, don't even know who their great grandparents were. Um, and that's why this is necessary. And it's not because of anything they did. They just don't care to know. Um, but, but. You know, um, a lot of time, a, a lot of, of the people my age, Jonathan's age, and, and we don't talk about what we have been through. We don't talk about the paths because it, it's, uh, it's painful. But if yeah. we don't talk about the paths, then our children can't know and they don't, they don't have anything to dig in and fight for. They got to know that they have a past. They got to know the, the, the struggle. But a lot of people, they don't want to tell their children because they, I guess they feel embarrassed by it or mm -hmm. the pain is too deep. But yeah. we got to fight the pain. And if they don't know, what is it? If you don't know your history, you're bound to repeat it? Mm -hmm. Well, I um, when I first met Margie, uh, she told me, we've got to go to my family reunion in Charlotte. Woo! And when we got down there, they were meeting in a high school gym. There was Neil's and Carruthers's and Belk's. That gym was full full of people. The last time Margie and I went to Charlotte for her family reunion, there were 32 people. And that these young people, I got to give them a hand, they were trying their best to get people to come out and find out about each other. And there were a lot of stories about intermarriages. Um, one of Margie's aunts, uh, her son came in with a girl and, um, oh, it's the other way around. Maybe it was the girl or the boy. And, uh, this young person said, mom, I want you to meet my date. And mom said, what you talking about? And she said, do you know who this is? She said, yeah, he mentioned the name and everything and found out it was his second cousin. Second cousin from Mooresville, lower end of Mooresville. And they didn't even not know anything about each other. And that happens a whole lot right now. But along with these, um, <clears throat> about the genealogy and I'm into that and, and we are trying our best. We've gotten back to our great, great grandfather and we're trying to get beyond that. But, uh, and we've done workshops and programs and um, we videoed people and that's hard, but, but also the families are not having reunions. And when I, I don't know about y'all, but if you, did you, I hope everybody saw the, the movie Roots. When I see that all the way through, I can't stop crying. Our people struggle. And they struggle after slavery. And it's like we took a turn after that. Uh, it's time for us to get over slavery. Martin Luther Hallelujah. said, I have, a, I have a dream. And Martin Luther King was one of our Moseses. but he wasn't able to go across Jordan. And Martin Luther King died at the age of 38.
Yeah. We gotta have a dream. Indeed. Well, I can say that this documentary has, or I'm gonna say it is, opening my eyes up to a lot of things because one thing that I love is my black history. And yeah. and uh, right now it's uh, really painting the picture is putting it all together because like you said, I was waiting. I've just been itching to hear everything that you all have said. And, mm -hmm. and what we are gathering back in the days, the blacks were more together. They tried to help each other. They wanted to make sure that each and every family member made it. And uh, today, they're not concerned. Thanks. Reverend Johnson. Yes. You know, um, you say black, back in the day, people, blacks looked out for each other. You know, um, that is kind of unfortunate. It kind of, the, the line kind of starts with segregation and integration of schools. When the schools were segregated, we had black teachers and those black teachers taught us. They knew what we needed, they taught us. They taught the families, they talked to the families, the parents and everything. And once we integrated, we never had home visits anymore. And we, we don't kind of care for, we don't have time to deal with the, we're so busy with the subject matter till we don't have time to deal with the students. And that, that started with integration. So it's good but it had some bad parts. Wow. There's also a lot, and I didn't know yeah. this until, <laughs> until um, I, I'm taking classes at Clinton right now at Clinton College in Rock Hill. Um, it wasn't until I, I took classes at an HBCU that I realized the power of community. Um, and I'm realizing this really recently. Um, I went to a church service and so many of my professors were in the church service mm -hmm. um, back in the day before uh, before uh, integration and, and likely shortly after in integration as well. You saw so many of your teachers at church. You saw them at the same community events. You, and now, you know, we travel like I'm in Raleigh as we speak. Um, the world is a much smaller place um, and people go to church all over the place. You don't see um, and a lot of people just don't go to church. Right. Um, so you don't see you don't see um, the people who are teaching you in the same spaces. Um, the people who are could make your village or could become your influences in the same spaces. Um, if there is a piece of morsel that still exists where that is untainted, I don't know of it. Do any of you have? Sorry. All right. I was just going to ask if any of you have any final remarks, anything that you feel like you didn't hit um, in relation to Black Morrisville or your Black Morrisville. Um, well, <clears throat> I see the, the Black church as one of the places that we can at least try to get back together and to move our people forward. Um, also, uh, politics is, is, is getting dirtier and dirtier. And I thought about this a, a little bit late. I'm almost 80 years old, but um, I'm 78. But, you know, you, you, can't, you can't do the schools, as Reverend just said. We got the church. And and the and the political world about the only way is to try to get something going. Um, the NAACP is working hard, but they need some footwork too. They need some help. They need some help. I'd like for, is there a way that we can, with this uh, video here, documentary, can we, can we, are we going to be able to distribute these or sell the copies or anything? 
Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we will. It will. We're going to be working on it until the first, till the right, right at the end of December, and it will be ready uh, in February, Black History uh, Month. Oh. Yeah. I've enjoyed it. Well, I want to thank you all for uh, for this interview, uh, and I know that uh, the uh, Sean has got quite a bit to work on <laughs> tonight with this. But I want to say this uh, with schools before uh, we close. I was in an REI training. I don't know how many are familiar with REI, but uh, uh, they were saying that uh, it was full of white people, a lot of them. There was a few of us Black that was there in the, in the class at the Institute of Training. And they were talking about the school system. And one thing that I found out here in Mooresville, in North Carolina, that North Carolina, 82% uh, of the teachers are white. And most of them are white females. So you look at the black male come from a single parent home, what he's dealing with there. But they were saying that uh, when they desegregated the schools, uh, there was black female teachers that was really involved with that, that pretty much got that done, desegregated uh, the schools. But the strange part of it, when they was teaching this class, they said that when the, once the schools was desegregated, they closed down the black schools, the ones that didn't close down, they renamed. And the black teachers were the ones without jobs. And she asked the question, said, why do you think that most black teachers were without jobs? A lot of whites were there, they around with questions and things. And she finally come out and told them, said the reason why the black teachers were without a job was because the white parents said they didn't want the N-word teaching their kids. Uh, and a lot of that still happens today. Yeah, a lot of that's still going on today. And then she asks another important question. She says, when, who do you think, which teachers do you think were the smartest? The white teachers or the black teachers? And I'll, the big majority of them said the white teachers, but she came back and straightened them out. She says, no, the black teachers were the smartest. And said the reason why the black teachers were the smartest because back then the parents didn't have the money to send them to college to be lawyers, doctors, judges, and uh, scientists, and astronauts, and all this, this other stuff. Only thing that the black parents had money to do with their kids was send them to the school to get a college degree. I mean, get a, a, a college degree with, with go to teach. But so what made them smarter because they had all of that other wisdom and knowledge inside of them. And that's the reason why I can say today that before they, they said they with the schools, like Ella said, when we had our own teachers, Yes, they cared for us. They taught us what we needed. They did everything that was proper, was was profitable for us. And and I think that we all did good, did well, because I got a lot of educators in my family that went off to college and done great things, and uh, and still got a lot of teachers and educators in my family right to today. But uh, I think it, I have to give props, the credit to what the black teachers did before they desegregated the schools. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to share that with you all. And uh, once again, if any of you have any closing remarks, uh, Reverend Gable, uh, Sean, um, uh, Craig, we want to thank all of y'all. Anybody got anything to say before we proceed to close, please do so. I have a question. You started, you started to talk about your experience at um, Mooresville, but then you said you would wait and say it at the end. When you were at Mooresville Senior, I think what I was saying that they want me to give my uh, 
uh, interview at the end. <laughs> oh, 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 not in, not in this. Right, not in this setting. Setting. Oh, no. okay. Well, he has what, a lot. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. Um, the only thing I would say is Mooresville. While we taught more at Mooresville, Mooresville taught us as well. Like I said at the beginning, Marge and I were both Presbyterians, but we ended up going to the your church, your Jerusalem, a Baptist church. And one Sunday while I was playing, um, there was going to be baptism. I had never seen a, an immersion, a submersion baptism because I'm Presbyterian. You know, we just sprinkle. Um, mm -hmm. I was playing and the floor underneath the, the pulpit, they, op they opened it up and they started walking down and I'm sitting there playing and saying, what is going, <laughs> what is going? That was my first experience of a submersion uh, bap baptism. Mm -hmm. And it's good that I learned it there because I met a Baptist man and now I'm Baptist and I have been submerged. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Two thumbs up. A and T and Black Baptist. Okay. Anybody else got anything that they'd like to say before? Sean, you got anything you'd like to add? Craig, I know you got something you would like to share with us before we uh, proceed to close. Uh, this, this has been an honor uh, to be a part of this. And I hope, you know, and I pray that a lot of useful, useful, useful information will come out of it uh, that can help. Uh, raise awareness and maybe trigger someone to to want to take the challenge uh, a lot of times a lot of us that leave home and and never move back uh, we, we're quick to criticize but we're not quick to come back home and pitch in uh, and i think a lot of us need to make the commitment that if more were calls upon us to be a part of something that's positive that we'll commit to come back and be a part of it. Uh, and that's that's what I like to say. Oh, thank you. Uh, let me say this right quick before. Uh, now, everybody, all of you all that was, that's gonna be in the documentary, we gotta figure out how we can get a consent form to you. I don't know, maybe Reverend Gabriel might know how we can do it where you can uh, sign it electronically. Uh, I don't know, or maybe Sean might know how we can email it to you. If not, we'll just have to put it in the mail to you and you sign it, get it back to us. Uh, uh, Ella, I think you and Craig, Craig might be home for the holidays. I don't know. Uh, but we'll make sure we get it done before the end of the year. But the re reason why we would want you to sign a consent form uh, is because that if you are Great, 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 great grandkids 50 years from now see this documentary and say, my grandmother, my grandfather, they put them in that documentary. Did they give them consent to do that? So we want to make sure we dot all of our I's and cross all our T's uh, for you to uh, get to, to be in this documentary. Uh, Reverend Gabriel, you got anything you would like to add or Sean before we uh, proceed to close? That's actually the one thing, what I was going to say. <laughs> Great. Oh, yeah. well, yeah, okay. Yeah, the one thing I would like to say is um, if you guys have pictures oh, that you yeah. can scan, scan those pictures and send them to Curtis. Okay. Yeah. yeah, Craig, we definitely need some of you in your, in your full dress uniform. I think I've seen some on Facebook, but I'm pretty <laughs> sure you probably got others. Yeah. I just I just sent you a picture of uh, the Campbell brothers. This was Martin and Odell, and these were this picture was had to be back in the early 1900s. It's 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 uh, Grandpa Jimmy's father, okay. um, Aunt Grace's father, and uh, Waddell Caldwell. The Caldwells, uh, Beverly Caldwell and Clay, and all of them, their great grandfather. Uh, it's a very interesting picture. So I just emailed it to you, Kurt. Okay, thank you. Hey, uh, uh, Reverend Gabriel, that's uh, the, uh, the, the Odell and all that that's in that book. 
that you have that you read. Those are the guys that he sent me the picture of. Amen. And my brother Roger will have to tell you who all five of the brothers. I know three of them. Uh, I'm not sure. I, I don't know the names of two of them, John. Okay. Okay. So if... Who, who do we send the pictures to? You want pictures like pictures, if I can find them, of, of Mr. and Mrs. Campbell and stuff like that? Uh, if you can find them, that would be great. But mainly, we would like to have a picture of you if you're younger, you know, when you were younger. A teacher. Now, or, or teacher. Okay, you know, do you have a copy of the yearbook, the pitchfork? No, Jonathan? you told me about that, and I hadn't got to the library yet. To, okay, to well, you you will find us in, in the pitchforks. Okay, okay. I know six, I have 68, and Marge and I are both in here, and I know we're probably in 69. And Jonathan, you have the other ones. I've got all those. And if you go by the Mooresville Library and see Mr. Is it Poor? Andy. Andy Poor. Yeah. Yeah. He's yeah. the historian. Yeah. He, I was supposed to have a meeting with him today, but uh, we canceled the meeting. <laughs> yeah, he'll hook he'll hook you up because I I've got pictures of all of my wife and Ella and all that. I've got all those. Okay. And uh, I don't have the yearbooks, all of them, but I've got pictures of of them in the yearbooks okay no college pictures together college oh. pictures mm -hmm. oh uh ella uh-huh i've got some stuff in marge's albums with you and when you guys were pledging and all those uh, kind of really okay. <laughs> good stuff <laughs> good stuff graduation from Bob scotia Oh my goodness. L, are you giving him the consent? I will give him consent. Okay. <laughs> yes. Miss Ella, are you AKA? Yes, I am. All right, okay. Skiwi. <laughs> <laughs> hey, oh, hold on a minute. Hold on uh oh. A <laughs> I'm glad Margie brought you to Scotia or took you to Scotia. <laughs> And she she taught you right. <laughs> I was just speaking to a, a former professor at Barbara Scotia. When did they lose their accreditation? 1994. Uh-huh. Oh, no, 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 no. No. Yes, was it 1990? Uh, I think it was, I think it was, wasn't it in the, just in no, the- No, 2004, 2004. 2004. 2004. Oh, wow. 2004. Okay. Well, <laughs> And AKA hat. <laughs> That's Marge's hat. Marge's yeah. AKA hat. It would be so good to have that pledging yeah. picture. That's got it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I pledged under Margie. Okay. <laughs> she went under, she went over under the Charlotte chapter. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I was a senior when I went over under her. Yeah. <laughs> Two good buddies. All right. All, right. All right. Well, we want to say we're going to wrap this up for tonight and uh, we're going to say happy Thanksgiving. And we, we, uh, I don't do the gobble or the ghost thing, so I'm going to say happy Thanksgiving and Merry <laughs> Christmas to everybody. And uh, Amen. We, will, we will definitely be in touch uh, on getting this consent form uh sign uh we'll we'll figure a way that we can get it done electronically if like i said if not then we if we email you and said uh send us your your address and then we'll put it in the mail and you just send it right back to us uh we have to have it done before uh the end of the year but we'll get it done sometime in the next couple of weeks okay. thank you for letting us be a part yes and and when you send the consent you can go on and send us an order form for the yeah. documentary. Okay. <laughs> Hopefully yeah. we'll have a screening at, at Charles Mack in February. That's the, I think that's yeah. the plan still, so. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. And then we have the, the trailer, the trailer. When would the trailer be ready, uh, do you think, uh, Sean? I mean, we got a title now. Okay. Yeah. okay. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you, you, he's working on the trailer now, so we should, Hopefully we can uh, have the trailer out for the Christmas and there let everybody see it, hopefully. Beautiful. Yeah. Wish Marjorie could have seen this. Oh, yes, yes. She's seeing it. She's looking. Yes. 
Yeah. Amen. Okay, Reverend Gabriel, if you would lead us, uh, it closes out with a word of prayer. Uh, Absolutely. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this opportunity that you've given us to recall times of old, to, to remember what you have brought us through, to remember how you have blessed us so immensely. God, we will continue to recall all of these things in the coming days, and God, we will continue to lift you up as a result of it. All these things we receive in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And good night to all of you. All good of you. Night. Good, night. Good, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good stay young. All right. Tell Crystal I said hello. <laughs> all righty. We'll do then. All right. Bye-bye. <laughs>